invite our Dominic Disida, our digital professional who has been part of the Indian media entertainment for over two decades. In addition to completing his studies in law, he also has to his credit a master's degree in mass communication journalism. He has been a part of major Indian media companies such as TV, Balaji Telefilms, and Shemaru Videos, all companies listed on the National Stock Exchange. As also with the interna international media companies, oh my God, such as the Walt Disney and Star India Private Limited. He is presently the vice president of the legal regulatory with the Hinduja Ventures, a company listed on National Stock Exchange and one that has substantial stake in India. I now invite Dominic D'Souza to please take over. Uh, thank you, Ashwini, for kind words and a uh, very good evening to all of you all and I hope all of you all are keeping well and safe. Uh, can one of you all let me know if you all can hear me loud and clear? Yes, sir, we can. Yes, sir, we can. That's great. It's yes, okay sir. if you don't see me, but it's important to hear what I'll be saying in the next uh, half an hour or so. Well, uh, first of all, a uh, uh, of thanks and, uh, and a heartfelt uh, gesture of gratitude to Christ University, who's invited me uh, to be the first person to share my thoughts during this uh, webinar of Twilight Talks and wish the entire session all the very best. And uh, yep, as we say in the media, break a leg and break many more legs of success. Uh, so coming to what exactly we've been uh, trying to uh, talk about, and that has been, I think the, the crux of the media of late has been what exactly is the media about and what is the role of the media okay so if i were to talk about what is the role of the media and that's what we'll try to uh, get through in next uh, half an hour or so uh, we'll be trying to analyze what exactly is the role of the media during a crisis there is no doubt in my mind, and I'm sure there's no doubt in your mind, that what we are going through is a crisis, a crisis which has uh, not been seen in India for a very, very long time. They, there are experts who would like to say it's been a crisis uh, similar to the likes of a World War scenario with the number of deaths which are taking place. Uh, we are hearing good news and not so good news uh, of vaccines being uh, processed and being invented. Yet at the same time, we are hearing of deaths which continues taking place. And the basic question is, where are we getting this information from? How authentic is it? Uh, is there a veracity to it? And what exactly is the role of the media? And that's what most of us are here. Media professionals, either already in the media for several years or getting into the media. And today I thought we could discuss perhaps what is the future as we, uh, so we as media professionals have in terms of a crisis like that. And my dear friends, is what we'll be talking about uh, shortly. The media per se has been uh, broken up into what we would call broadcasting. And today there's something called the OTT, the over the top media. Broadcasting, if you look at it, has got uh, its uh, genealogy or technology, if you want to put it that way, where it is a one to many models. What does it mean? That you are dispersing or disseminating information from a single source to multiple receivers through an intermediary. You will have a broadcaster, you will have a receiver, the consumer, and 
intermediary in the middle, and that is what we would call the entire broadcasting. If you're looking at an OTT platform, however, that seems to be missing because the OTT platform bypasses the traditional platforms. It bypasses the controlling elements which may be there, which are present in broadcasting. Let me give you an example. A broadcaster, for the signal of a broadcaster or for you to watch a channel at home, we need a DPO, a digital, uh, a digital service provider. That is either an MSO, a DTH operator, or a local cable operator, etc. That itself acts as a mechanism for a check. For example, you can have the Cable TV Act, which kind of has a play over there. Therefore, they can act as a barrier from what is being telecast and what is being received. The media of an OTT platform is very different. We, most of us, have an app or uh, either of a broadcaster or of a news or uh, app, etc. There, there is no filter. What the service provider, rather, what the owner of the app would like you to watch, you are watching or you have an option to watch it, depending on whether you want it to or whether you want to watch it or not. And so we are now talking about, in fact, the new media and the traditional media. And while we talk about the new media vis-a-vis -vis Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, ODD platforms, all of it essentially would come under a new media. As against a traditional media, which is broadcasting, radio, television, print. And therein lies the challenge of what is the purpose of the media during a time of crisis. And I thought we will kind of traverse the period of time and go through what exactly we think is the purpose of the I'm sure none of y'all will doubt any of this. We've had dissemination of information, data. Education takes place through the media, of course. Uh, entertainment, uh, a lot of uh, it lacking these days with repeat programs. Uh, the media has been a source of social change. It has been, in many places, the source or the backdrop under which revolutions have taken place. Society has changed, governments have fallen. All of it has been through the media. It has been an awareness platform. There's absolutely no doubt, uh, no doubt in my mind about that. Be it at any point of time, the media has also been a means to instruct, advise, and guide. But the underlining factor, and that is where the crux of the matter lies, is to generate revenues. So if you're looking at, is it a CSR activity of a broadcast? My view would be no. It's a social outreach program of a, uh, of a rich industrial company, no. Revenues are a separate principle, are a separate objective, unless perhaps it is, uh, as we would call it, a governmental responsibility in many cases. So let's go through some, in my view, we've already, we are very familiar with all of this. The role of the media for dissemination of information. Today is a very classical uh, situation where you've got dissemination of information. You've got entertainment happening, uh, which is the non-regular entertainment. You've got awareness being created. You've got uh, advice, how to stay safe guidance happening, how do you protect yourself, all of it happening in the media, be it traditional, be it television, be it radio, be it print, be it broadcasting, be it the internet, be it anything, but very often, not very often, but it is the subtle undertone is that how do I get eyeballs and how do I generate revenues? The major objective of Prasad Bharati, and I'm just taking a few of it, uh, just two, three points of it, is, uh, is pretty interesting. 
to safeguard the rights of, in, of citizens to, uh, so that is one is the safeguard, safeguarding citizen's right, and a fair and balanced flow of information. A balanced and fair flow of information. Okay. Let's look at another point. Uh, come to the last point, to promote research and expand broadcasting faculties and development in broadcast technology. These are the objectives of Prasar Bharati. And when I talk about Prasar Bharati, they are uh, the government-owned broadcasting center, be it uh, All India Radio, be it Doordarshan, the 20, 28 plus, 30 plus uh, Doordarshan channels, which are across India. What are the objectives of the MIB, the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting? I've just mentioned the top three, and it, it is exactly or what we are looking at, the purpose of the, of the media as being envisaged. Uh, let us not uh, mince words and say, uh, this is not. This is what the media is about. To create an environment and set up a policy framework for healthy development of various mass media in the country. Okay? To keep people informed about governmental policies and programs through mass media to educate and motivate the people to greater participative involvement in the various de developmental activities and programs of the government. If you do an analysis of what I've just put up in the previous slide and this, you will realize that in, this is my quick analysis, nowhere is the government talking about entertainment. Nowhere is the government talking about spending tax money to entertain people on a frivolous matter, if I may say. The government in this case is very concerned at the dissemination of information, of its policies, of what is happening to the people of India. And therefore, what you are now looking at is a public sector objective and a private sector objective. Uh, for those of us in the, in the uh, media for over a decade, if not longer, we'll always smile at this because it's very easy to identify the objectives of a private uh, broadcaster. The objective of a private object uh, of a private broadcaster is simple: money. The objective of a government uh, broadcasting uh, set, sector or center is not revenue. It has never been revenues, and in my view, it will never become revenues. Of course, you will look at a certain amount of revenues coming in, in terms of self-sustenance, but generally, my view would be no. It would still reach out as a social obligation the government has been fulfilled from time to time. Ironically, if you do look at uh, the CDC, uh, which is a US-based body, during a crisis, uh, they talk about how there is an interdependent of the media with uh, the medical. And they've written it down in as one of the most important communication partners during an emergency is the media. Now, this is an observation which they are instructing their officials. Don't be nervous to work with the media. The media serves as an, as an emergency broadcast system to get vital information to the people who need it most. They and their audience are most interested in knowing what happened and how to stay safe. Let us not forget the media in the US is privatized. The government does not have any broadcasting mechanism over there. In India, we do have it. Okay. Yet, in a place where entire media is privatized or owned by private parties, they still feel the need to have the media as an emergency broadcast system. This, I think, is an underlining factor in the media throughout the world. <clears throat> Let's look at some recent things. I'm talking about 2019. 
Uh, ironically, if you look at the map on the right, that is a Twitter heat map when the IPL was going on. Okay, that's the Twitter heat map when the IPL was going on. And approximately 4.8 million tweets from teams, players, and fans. Hotstar had something like 267 million viewers for the IPL in the first three weeks. These are the numbers which we are talking about when we are talking about India. We are not about one or two, we are talking about millions. And if you take it ahead, in the very recent past, in the very, very recent past, just a few weeks back, uh, there seems to be some distortion happening on the screen. Uh, whoever's doing that, kindly draw, uh, don't use the uh, drawing option, please. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, just to have a look at this, we've had cases where uh, the news has jumped, the news channels has jumped like 219%. Movies have jumped, viewership has jumped 73%. Uh, GEC has not grown substantially. Why? Because we've seen a lot of channels which are being repeated time and time out. Uh, in terms of the media, you broadcasting you used to have prime time, non-prime time. Today, non-prime time has grown 76%. Very simple. Why? All of us are at home. What do you do when you're home? Well, watch TV. After some time, what do you do when you get bored? Sleep, eat. What do you do after that? Watch TV. The non-prime time pattern has been broken and therefore now people are watching television during non-time times, non-prime time, and during prime times. Because perhaps that is what it is, okay? Children are at home. Children's child viewership has gone up substantially over a period of time. This is the bark rating uh, in, if you're looking at two weeks back. The highest watched channel is Durdasha. And take a guess which program. The highest watched program in the world of late has been Ramayana, where we've had something like 77 million viewers. We've never had that in India. 7.7 .7 crore viewers watching Ramayan. Ramayan, we are not talking about is a new program. It is an old program which has been rerun. I think man is looking to find solace in the divine during a crisis. After you turn left or right, where do you look up? You look up and you say, help. I think that's where it is reaching. And uh, Difficult to say if it's going to be a pattern where religious programs are going to be taking over. But let's say for the time being, religious programs are dominating many of the channels which are there. Okay. Uh, of course, the fallout has been the revenue spends have dropped. As per industry experts, they are looking at just 20% of revenues are coming in from advertisements. How does a broadcaster make money? In subscription events, special programs, uh, uh, merchandise, uh, what syndication Same content is shown on other channels. All of this, this is fine, but to what extent? What are the challenges we face in the media? Before we get onto that, I think it's inter it's interesting and important to understand how was the dissemination of information taking place. So if you look at the world wars, you had an event which took place. You had the first responders reaching there, you had them briefing the media and the media briefing the public. You don't have that. They, if an event takes place, it goes straight to the public. It's not just the people at the venue who are updating the public, but the first responders and the media briefings and therefore, Collectively, it is no more what it was, or top down. Now it's just one layer down and everyone has the news. So essentially, if you're looking at the mass of people there, they get the news. What happens when they, they disseminate it? 
Now, let me ask you a very important question. What happens if the source of the news is corrupt? What happens if the source of the news is inaccurate? What happens if the source, your source of the news is biased? I think this is a very crucial thought which we need to keep in mind today. What are the name? What are the challenges? I'm just naming a few. Now I am a practicing lawyer in the High Court, and uh, part of uh, what you would say, uh, consultants uh, with several media companies, and therefore yes, there will be a bit of the 191A, because 191A is the bedrock of the media freedom of speech and expression as manifest through the media. And that exactly is the basis of it. <laughs> Yet, along with 191A, you've got Article 21, which is life, the, the right to life, which is a very fundamental thing, right to life and dignity. So you have to look at it complementing each other. If we are talking about the life and dignity, we are talking about the life and dignity of someone else. It's not just me, it's somebody else. Today we are talking about invasion of privacy. Uh, why do I say it? Because uh, a lot of people have certain concerns, right or wrong is not the forum, this is not the forum, of certain information which is made available. That is a challenge. I think, but this is not the time to really question what is being done. What is being done? Yes, certain safeguards, but the media, I think, has a much larger role. Objectivity, truthfulness, accuracy. Can what I am listening to or the news or the information I'm getting be unbiased? Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the statement that the media is bought. I would like to defer with that. Rather, I would like to say there are certain commercial constraints. We'll talk about fake news. Well, I'm sure all of us are aware of this, and this is really a challenge today, as we shall further see. In the new media, we've got reputational assaults via social media, left, right, center. No apologies, no accuracy. You say what you want. Dissemination without verification. This perhaps is a huge challenge because no one has verified it. And if it is not verified today with the blur, and that's where the next thing comes, you can watch a video of something which has happened overseas and presume it is India because why? Someone has said, oh, it is happening in a certain state in India. May or may not be a fact. The blur of international boundaries puts a higher responsibility on us in the media and those professionals in the journalism sector. There is no doubt in my mind about that. Today we've seen in the past 48 hours, we've seen something extremely tragic happening in terms of the, bi uh, the Instagram, the BIOS locker uh, scandal which has happened, the boys uh, locker scandal which has happened. And very often, not in this case though, very often the privacy policies of such kind of sites restricts enforcement agencies from really doing something about it quickly. The flip side is, I think all of us who are internet savvy have to be mindful of what happens on the internet and be careful about it. I think here is a very classical case, prevention is better than cure. In terms of the broad, uh, in terms of an OTT platform, the challenge I think just one is the <clears throat> the privacy data, and that, my friends, in my view, is a challenge. Who owns the data which we put on while accessing a certain OTT platform? Who has access to it? What is the information we are making available? Our credit card details, for sure. And of course, sometimes you do have cultural sensitivities which emerge. In India, we've had a lot of revolutions. I'm not joking. In terms of media revolutions, don't get ideas. The first revolution was in 1982, where we had color TV. 
But Asian Games was an event and not a crisis. It was an event. India was proud. You had the launch of Doordarshan. You had the launch of the Color TV in India. That was the first revolution in India. I'm talking about in the recent past. Then came the Gulf War, Desert Storm and Desert Shield, 1992. That took cable TV to a new length. You had live reporting, you had news channels, and that people were able to go into a war zone without even being there. You had channels like CNN, and it just gave you a live update of the world of what was happening over there, the Gulf War. ZTV launched around that time. Why am I saying it? Because there have been strategic or there have been major events which have happened, which have triggered something in the media to really go and take it to a, a notch higher, to take it to another level. These are two cases which have been there. Of course, 1995, uh, the uh, internet does open up to the public by government-owned BSNL, BSNL. 1996, Indian Express and do set up their own uh, websites. Why am I saying it is? Because when you look at all of this, these revolutions have been based on 191A, freedom of speech and expression, and on Article 21. Okay. By virtue of 191A, the right of the freedom of the press, freedom of speech and expression, all of this have really flowed. Right to re receive information, right to conduct interviews, right to be entertained, right to silence, right to circulate definitely in terms of the printing press, newspapers, etc. All of this is a possible, not is, all of this has been a fallout and a consequence of 191A. Freedom of the press, freedom of, the, of uh, radio, media, broadcasting, uh, of commercial speech, freedom of the new media, all with reasonable restrictions. And what are the, the restrictions, if I may say? We are talking about integrity of India, uh, incitement to an offense, etc. We do not have and we do not have absolute freedom of speech in India, and rightly so. I was attending a webinar recently where one of the topics was, is the Disaster Management Act a violation of Article 21? Because by virtue of the Disaster Management Act, I am now being directed to stay at home because of a lockdown. Is it an impingement of my personal liberty? I laugh and smile at these kind of dis uh, discussions. And I, although I participate in it, the reason is because we have 191A, we can talk about Article 21. Because we do have a fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression, I can talk about the impingement of my personal liberty. If I didn't have it, I wouldn't be talking about it, right? So in the words of my friend Spider-Man, with greater power comes greater responsibility. As we are talking about restrictions, yes, there is a responsibility which comes. Being a lawyer, I thought I'll just touch upon a few slides on what has really happened. We've got this case of R.K. Anand, Anand versus Registrar of uh, Delhi High Court in the Supreme Court. And uh, in 2009, the Supreme Court made an observation saying, the media trips mostly on TRPs when commercial considerations assume dominance over higher standards of professionalism. I'm sure we agree with it, right? And he goes on to say, it is not our intent here to lay down any reformist agenda for the media. Any attempt to control and regulate the media from outside is likely to cause more harm than good. The norm to regulate the media and to raise its professional standards must come from inside. This was 2009. Let's take it forward. We have this case in 2011. Uh, Ajmal Kashab was the state of Maharashtra, terrorist when that point, uh, when the attempt happened, when the terrorist attack happened, my apologies. Year two, the court says, the freedom of expression, like all other freedoms under 19, Article 19, is subject to reasonable restrictions, 
right? And it goes on to say, it is in such extreme cases that the credibility of an institution is tested. In this case, the media institution is tested. The coverage of the Mumbai terror attacks by the mainstream electronic media has done much harm to the argument that any regulatory mechanism for the media must come only must only come from within. This goes on in 2016. The court will not regulate media content. Now we're talking about uh, media content. Pre-broadcast or pre-publication censorship is not the business of the court and that all grievances against objectionable content will be dealt with in accordance with the law of the land after publication. So here is the court again reaffirming there is no uh, uh, pre-censorship. We are expecting a responsible media. In fact, the most recent case when the migrant issue first took place around March, uh, the Supreme Court in uh, Alaknath Srivastava versus Union of India repeated the sentence which was made by Dr. Tridhar, who was the director, the DG of the WHO. And the court repeated what he had said, wherein it was mentioned, we are not just fighting an epidemic, we are fighting an infodemic. Fake news spreads faster and more easily than this virus and is just as dangerous. In fact, in the same matter, the court came out with rather strong observations, if you want to put it. In particular, we expect the media, print, electronic, or social, to maintain a strong sense of responsibility and ensure that unverified news capable of causing panic is not disseminated. The day, a daily bulletin by the government of India, this is what we see on all news channels. And then look at the last sentence. We do not intend to interfere with the free discussion about the pandemic, but direct the media refer to and publish the official version about the developments. Why? Because the official versions are perhaps more accurate than what is being hyped about in other channels. I'm not saying the other channels are inaccurate, but perhaps we need to be even more cautious during a pandemic at this point of time. And so we've got something called self-regulation. And that, in my view, is the need of the hour, self-regulation, because all of us, I'm sure the journalists, students will be happy, all of us are journalists in our own way. You put up a message, that is a item. You put up a blog, that itself is an item, is a news item. Hi, how are you? Well, that's a query, and you reply saying, I am fine. That is an, a news item that you are fine. And I'm just giving you, it's just a, a statement, but we have to be mindful of what we are putting up at all points of time. We've got the NBA, we've got the IBF, we've got the ASCII, I'm sure some of you all are familiar with it. And for the Digital News Publishers Association, we've got another one, the DNPA, and for the video streaming acts, uh, apps, you've got the Internet and Mobile Association of India. Friends, what is the need of the hour? I thought I'll just pin down a few. Self-regulation, no doubt. Collective consciousness. Do, I, do we, and I'm not saying me or you, do we collectively take a decision not to spread something which is unverified? Maybe fake news, maybe genuine. But if I am unable to verify it from at least two other good sources or accurate sources, let me not publish it. Let me not spread it. The need of the media today and for all of us is a moral and ethical bar barometer. The standard has to be higher than normal. We cannot really keep it where it is. The need to do social good, and I'm not talking about uh, going out and doing good. Definitely not. The need to do good as maybe we can think of spreading something nice, something positive, something lifting within a group or whatever, wherever we are. Perhaps it's time to put our country, our friends, our family before us. And so therefore coming to 
what is the purpose of the media again? Dissemination, education, entertainment, the media an instrument for social change, a platform for awareness, a means to instruct, advise and guide. The same, it does not change. But maybe, and just maybe, this is not the time for revenues. The revenues will always come. This is the time for us to be true to ourselves, especially for us in the media. Godspeed and keep safe. Right. Uh...